I'd like to now introduce uh, a gentleman I met perhaps uh, two months ago. It was sort of a last minute ad because I, I was at, in New York at Jim McCann, the, the chairman of Willis Towers Watson, introduced to me by Anna Catalano. I was at his offices uh, meeting with one of his colleagues. He popped into the office and said, there's a guy here I want you to meet. This stuff's going to blow you away. It did. I'm not going to tell you anything more except to introduce uh, the good Dr. Jeffrey Ling to the stage. Jeffrey. Well, thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to share with you. I think that what we're really talking about is opportunity. And opportunity is available to all of us, and it's a question of what we do with it. And what is fun about being in an audience and participating with all of you all is that you, too, are using opportunity to actually try to make the better uh, a future for everybody uh, throughout the world. And that's an awesome thing. But you know, on life's journey that uh, presents itself with opportunity, you always say to yourself that, gee, there's got to be that seminal moment that kind of steers you one way or another. And I'll just share with you mine. So I started life, I uh, wanted to be a scientist. I went to scientist school, got a PhD. Then I decided along the way I, wanted to be a do I needed to be a doctor. So I went to medical school, got to be a doctor. But along that pathway, uh, it became grossly apparent that uh, I was poor. And so, um, <laughs> so I needed to ask our uncle to give me a loan. And so our uncle, of course, was incredibly generous and, in fact, decided to pay for my education. Of course, that's Uncle Sam. And then um, Uncle Sam, of course, since I was done, said, uh, you need to work on the farm for a little while and pay off your debt. So I went and worked on his green farm, which is the Army. And so I was an Army officer for a few years. And they were really good to me. I mean, I will tell you right now that the Army was like the best in the whole wide world to me. They, they put me at Walter Reed, where I got to practice medicine. They also signed me to USIS, which is the military medical school where I had a lab. And so I was just like anybody else, except I wore a uniform every day. Fast forward a little bit, paid off my debt to society, as it were. And then I um, sold the house, was going to move to Boston, take a position at, at uh, HMS, uh, Harvard Medical School. But then something remarkable happened right after I sold my house, 9-11. So when 9-11 hit, I could not leave the service. There's just no way on earth I was going to leave the service. So I stayed in. And my wife was very supportive, and we just we stayed. 2003 came about, and I find myself uh, with the 452nd Combat Support Hospital in the northeast corner of Afghanistan. And it galvanized everything. That was a remarkable opportunity. It was just a wonderful opportunity. I got to take care of some amazing young people, and I got to take care of a lot of people I normally would not have taken care of. 90% of the patients, the vast majority of the patients I took care of when I was at the, uh, the 452nd Cache were actually Afghans. So here you are, you're in this very interesting space, and a lot of things gel together, and you get these cool ideas. You say, I got to make things better. I just want to make things better. And we all want to do that. And so when I came home from my deployment, I got, a, I got that fateful phone call, and I went to this remarkable, magical place called DARPA. And I joined DARPA as a program manager. And DARPA gave me the opportunity to make things happen, because DARPA is a place where people look to say yes. They look for ways to say yes. When you think about all the things you try to do, all the opportunities you want to leverage, it's easy to talk yourself out of it. There's too many competitors in the space. The inroads of the market is really, really super high. The science is just too hard. Nobody's ever done it. Blah, 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 blah. Change that to what the heck. Let's find a way to say yes. And then put your mind towards that process and say, I'm going to forget about all the barriers. I'm just going to say, if I had a magic wand and I had unlimited funding and all that other good stuff, how would I get from A to Z? And then things happen. Remarkable things happen. So one of the things that happened when I was uh, overseas, sorry about that, is I came across patients who got hurt, really badly hurt. And one of the real bad ways to get hurt that really negatively impacts your life is to lose your arms. If you lose your arm, you lose your hand. And think about how you interact. Your cell phone, your keyboard, you write. When we talk, we gesture. To lose your arms and hands is a very disabling, physically challenging event. And it's even worse if you're in an environment like Afghanistan and you're trying to just survive. So came home, and I got to go to this very magical place. 
And then um, as I was getting used to it, the Army called me again and said, Jeff, you're going back to the war. And I went to Baghdad, Iraq in 2005, where I served with both the 10th and the, and the 86th combat support hospitals. And then I was seeing young Americans hurt. So I came home and I said, hmm, let's find a way to get a replacement arm that is not a prosthetics in the conventional way. In fact, let's do a Luke Skywalker. Let's actually come up with a replacement arm that looks like an arm, feels like an arm, tied in the brain so when a person thinks, I'm going to go grab that apple, they grab that apple. Everybody will tell you at that time, which was 2005, you're, it's not going to happen. But let's find a way to say yes. Let's find a way to say yes. And if you look at it, you say to yourself, how do I do that? Well, one is you got to tap into the brain. And if you tap into the brain, you got to understand those signals and you got to translate it into something that will make this prosthetic work. That's neuroscience. And the second thing is, is you got to build an arm. I mean, this guy's arm can only weigh eight pounds, because your, your native arm weighs eight pounds. You don't want a guy walking around like this. It's got to be quiet, or you're going to go in a, in, a, in a movie and go eek, 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 eek. So it's got to be quiet. It's got to do everything you want an arm to do. It's got to look like this, and it's got to look like this. That's engineering. So when you stop and you say, how do I say yes? It's only two things you need. You need neuroscientists, and you need engineers. You slap them together. That's it. That's it. And it's said, oh my gosh, it's so easy. <laughs> but what you do is you find like-minded folks like yourselves. If I came into this room, you would all say, yeah, we can do this. If you give us the time and the effort and the money, we can actually do this. And so we would say, let's, let's do it. So you find those people, those remarkable people, you bring them together, and in fact, magic happens. True magic happens. And I'm not going to go through the whole process, but if you could play that video, with this was not a fool, uh, this was not a fool's pursuit. So, um, can you guys play the video? Or do what? There. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Can you play that video? Does it? Ha it has sound. Can the sound come up? So this woman is a is a Christopher Reeve. She's trapped in her body. She can neither move her arms or her legs, but she's got a little chip in her brain and teeny tiny, it's, in fact, you see that little penny? That, 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 that chip is laying on top of that penny. That's laying on the surface of her brain. And she is able to move this arm the same way we do. Uh, it's a shame that the, uh, the audio is not playing. But in it, she's talking to Scott Pelley. She's like, I can shake hands with you. And she goes, I can even do a fist bump. And boom, she does a fist bump. And it's really cool. It's really cool. But it shows that But it shows that it can be done if you say yes. That program started in 2007 and was able to do that, as you see, in 2012. Five years. Five years. The arm itself, from conception to construct to FDA approval, FDA approval was seven years. It's fully 100% FDA approved. That arm is now going into the VA system because they had first crack at it because the DOD paid for it. So this is all good. But I want you to look at that as an opportunity space. This was a woman who was trapped in her body. Through this little itty bitty chip, she can now move her arm. She had an arm. And I will tell you what's remarkable about that arm is that hand spins 380 degrees. So she could actually play a game better than you can where you use dexterity. <laughs> and that's really cool, isn't it? You, what we've done is, what is evolution? What is evolution? Evolution is an adaptation to your environment. It is man has evolved because of, because of the brain that we have. And that's taken eons, millennia, to accomplish. And you say to yourself, what is next on our horizon? Is it a purely biological, or does it also include an in silico contribution? And I offer to you that they may very well do this. If you look at her, you say, that's cool. She's able to move an arm. The next patient, Nathan, by the way, has two chips, and we're going to give that patient, that patient is getting two arms. Why? Because that patient now can self-transfer to a wheelchair and get around. And even better, we're putting sensation back in. But we did something really cool with Jan. We hooked her up to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, because you know why I was at DARPA, and with the Department of Defense, we could do crazy stuff like that. <laughs> and you know what she did? Immediately, as soon as we hooked her up and flicked the switch on, she flew the F-35. 
That's the most difficult combat aircraft to fly. And you know why it was? Because when you talk to her, she tells you, I'm not moving a joystick to the rudders, to the Ariane's, blah, 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 blah. What she's thinking is, I'm climbing, I'm banking. And to her, she was flying. It's a different human experience. And that's what opportunity brings us. Also in Afghanistan, my first combat tour, I, I, did, I did six, by the way. But my first one in Afghanistan was, I needed a drug. I needed a medicine. And that medicine was bromocryptine. Forget what it does. I just needed to stabilize a young soldier so I could put them on that 11, uh, that, uh, excuse me, that 13 hour flight from Afghanistan to Longstuhl, Germany, where we had advanced care, because I was still in a tent. But it made no sense to me that I didn't have this drug. This is a generic drug. I could go to CVS and buy, I'm not joking, for a couple of bucks, all right, without their markup. And <laughs> so the only way I could get it was it got stuck into the flight suit of an F 16 pilot who flew it to me from Longstuhl, and that gas bill alone is just un without talking about it. But if you come back and think about the problem, you said, why I don't have this generic medication? And it's because of there was a drug shortage, uh, it's, a, it's a big logistics train to get to me, blah, blah, blah. So you say to yourself, how do I change this paradigm? And it's easy. Why don't I just make the doggone thing myself? I mean, I have a PhD in medicinal chemistry. Just give me a chemistry set. I'll make the doggone thing myself. You know? And why not? Why not? And so what you see here is just that. These, this machine that you're looking at right now is half the size of this podium. And there's three elements to it. The bottom parts, as you can see, are empty. And you, you stack them up, they come out to be the size of your home refrigerator. That machine is a chemistry set. It works a lot like the new soda machines you use at the Fuddruckers. You know, you push a button, and it squirts out some juice. It's, you know, some cherry Coke. And it pushes out some Sprite. It pushes out some orange. And next you know, you, you got your own soda, right? It works just like that. Bunch of pumps and valves. It's nothing super special. It's, in fact, idiotically simple. It's just a bunch of pumps and valves, use a bunch of core, simple chemi chemicals that you just mix together. Because after all, most generic medications are organic. So we just made out carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So in principle, if you had a, bowl, uh, a pencil and an egg, you can make anything you want. <laughs> all right? If you had the right device. And this machine will do just that. And so this machine is being optimized to go into the field to my combat support hospital so I can push them on. That machine right now that you're looking at, right now as you're looking at it, will, will make 14 separate different drug classes. It's being optimized right now to go to FDA, and for FDA, we're going to make 3,000 Cipro tablets a day with that machine. It can actually make 1 million doses of atropine a day, which is the, which is the uh, chemical that you need to treat uh, neurotoxic agents, right? This is being all for the military. Right, this is all for the military. And uh, when you say at 3,000 doses, I mean that's the pill that you would get at CVS. Now, when you do that, you say, what is the opportunity space, Jeff? Because that's just the military. Right now, I can tell you, one of the biggest problems that we have in the hospital is drug shortages. Drug shortages. I need drugs, they, and I can't get them. I just can't get them. Why? Because they're made overseas. 100% of our generic medicines are made overseas. So when we give up manufacturing in this country, we expose ourselves to these kinds of shortages and threats. And that's not a military threat. That is me practicing at Johns Hopkins. I still practice medicine. And, and the cost has gone up. Tetracycline, all you guys know tetracycline. $20 for 500 pills was the, was the wholesale price 10 years ago. Today it's $1,850. Look it up for yourself. And we can go down the list. But a machine like this in every hospital, you make your own, the hospital makes their own drugs, they make what they need, when they need it, and they control costs. Even better, I take this thing out to some of the places I've been, like Afghanistan, Liberia, the, you know, the Congo. They don't have generic medicines. They don't have generic medicines. They hope that drug companies will give them stuff for great largesse, but if they can make their own, it changes the paradigm. They're not no longer being given fish, they're taught to fish. That's the point. So I'm gonna wrap up right now really quick. I'm gonna share with you this. I love this conference. I tell you why it is, because it's people like the good Professor Walcott and all these other fine people, all the folks here who are looking for purpose, we all share the same thing. It's not the how, what, and when of a journey. It's the why. 
It's the why. And everybody in this real audience that I can see are so successful, but they're using their success to pivot it to make the world a better place. And that's an awesome thing. But I want to share you this, is that there are others who wish that they could do what we do. So we therefore have a responsibility to do what we do. When I was in Baghdad, one night, a unit got caught in a, in, a, in a bad firefight. They got hit by an IED. One young kid, 22 years old, got thrown out of the cupola of his Humvee and broke his back. What we call T2 to T4 fracture. Came to the combat support hospital. I was called on to see him. And the good news was is he did not have a spinal cord injury. He just had a broken back. That's it. Bones heal. That's a good thing. Spinal cords do not. So I said to him, son, you've got a T2 to T4 spinal, cord, uh, spinal column fracture. You've got a broken back, but you're OK. He starts to cry. He starts to blubber. And I say to him, son, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You have incurred this injury in, in battle. You faced up to the enemy. You will get a Purple Heart. I will personally write the citation for that Purple Heart. And he goes, that's not it. He goes, don't send me home. I said, why? Because you know what I am when I go home? So I said, no, what are you? He said, I'm a reservist. When I go home, I'm an assistant manager of a fast food restaurant. But here, I get to help the Iraqi people rebuild their country. So I don't really give a damn what the politicians think. I truly don't. I don't even care what the oil companies think. I care what this kid thinks. Because you know what this kid is? He is all of you guys. Because if you were put in his place to do what he was sent to do, you'd be doing it for that reason. That's what opportunity is all about. Thanks. Thank you.